First Samuel chapter two, and I'll start reading at verse one. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints And the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now Cana went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. But we're looking at Hannah's prayer there in the opening 10 verses. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this evening as we think of this prayer that Hannah prayed in praise to thee. And Lord, I just ask that our prayers will be filled with praise to thee. I pray, Lord, that we will um, not be caught up in ourselves when we pray and caught up in material things, but we'll remember the Lord when we pray and to give honor and praise to thee. We're so thankful for this, uh, for this example here in Scripture of a great prayer. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be prayers like this as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Tonight we're looking at Hannah's prayer. But we really think of it like it's a song because it's filled with so much praise. But I wonder, do you praise God when you pray? Have you ever noticed that when the Lord gave us the Lord's Prayer, that the prayer he taught us to pray starts with praise and ends with praise. It starts with our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then at the end it ends with to thine be the glory and the the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And a prayer that begins with praise and ends with praise, that's the kind of prayer where you can go to God and ask for daily bread. A prayer that begins with praise and ends with praise, that begins with looking to God in his greatness and ends with God in his greatness, is a prayer that lifts your spirits. I was listening to a preacher today, and he said, you know, sometimes you can pray and you're going to feel at the end of your prayer worse than when you started. (laughs) When does that happen? Well, that happens when our prayers is just filled with doom and gloom, as all we can think about as we pray is what's wrong and what we need and all of this. And we just keep praying about, and the mountain just gets bigger and bigger as we keep mentioning it. And we forget what we're praying. While we're praying, we forget the Lord and his greatness. We remember his greatness. That's what encourages us. That's what lifts our spirits as we remember that we're praying to the almighty God who can do all things well. And I see in our text that Hannah gives gives us a great example of a prayer of praise. She's exalting God. You think maybe that she'd be a little vengeful as she prayed and thinking, "Now now I'm so thankful that and now look at me compared to Penin, and now, now, now who's laughing? Now who's, no, she's not vindictive at all about Penin. 
Penina is not someone she's worried about. She's just talking between her and the Lord out of a pure heart. Uh, she prays the prayer of praise. I think of Hannah here, and you notice what she's praying about and what she's praising the Lord for. And it's not what I would have been praising the Lord for in this situation. You know what my prayer would have been if it was First Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 10? It would have been, Lord, thank you for this precious baby. <laughs> thank you for Samuel. Look at his eyes. Look at his nose. Look at his ears. Thank you, Lord, for this precious little boy. But Hannah wasn't focused on the gift. Hannah was focused on the giver. And often we get caught up with the gift, don't we? We get caught up with this world. We get caught up with, what, with, with the things we hold in our hands and forget that all every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of light with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And we forget to just praise the Lord. Praise him for what he's done. And Hannah in her prayer is praising him. I see in our text that Hannah's prayer is prophetic. It's a, Hannah is in the text is rejoicing and she's not rejoicing in the boy that she just had, but she is rejoicing in a boy that would come into this world. She's rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what she's rejoicing in in these verses. It's important to understand that when you look at these verses to keep in mind that she is looking ahead to the day of Christ. She has, she has seen in her life an example of God's economy. She's seen how God works, how he brings up the poor and exalts them and sets them in, 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 by the throne of glory. She's seen what God does. And she's looking ahead to the future when it happens once and for all, when Jesus Christ comes again. People argue about this prayer here. They say, well, I think that must have been written in the time of David because the last verse talks about his king and his anointed. The king in this verse is not David. The king is pointing to the end, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love thinking of how Hannah, before any king reigned over Israel, saw the king in his glory. These Old Testament saints, God gave them prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ and what was to come. Uh, listen to Albert Burns. He says, the song of Hannah is a prophetic song. It is poetry and it is prophecy. It takes its place by the side of the songs of Miriam, Deborah, and Mary, as well as those of Moses, David, Hezekiah, and other psalmists and prophets whose inspired oaths have been preserved in the Bible. The special feature which these songs have in common is that springing from and in their first conception relating to incidents in the lives of the individuals who compose them, they branch out into magnificent descriptions of the kingdom and glory of Christ and the triumphs of the church of, those, of which those incidents were providentially designed to be the types. So this psalm points us to Christ. Hannah is rejoicing in Christ. And uh, she's not praising the gift. She's praising the giver. She's an Old Testament saint. But like Father Abraham, she rejoiced to see his day. And she saw it and was glad. And she's rejoicing in our Savior. And so when we realize that Hannah is rejoicing in our Savior, I think we can all understand that this psalm, this prayer here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it relates to us. The things that Hannah is praising the Lord for are the same things we can praise the Lord for today in 2022. In fact, one might say it's even more applicable today in 2022 AD than it was to Hannah back in BC before Christ came the first time, because we can see more clearly who she's talking about. And so what is she rejoicing in the Lord this evening? First of all, she's rejoicing in his salvation. She's rejoicing in his salvation. Look at verse number one. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. She rejoices in the Lord because she rejoices in his 
salvation. Her heart is rejoiced. And that word rejoicing, it's the idea of jumping for joy. I jump for joy in the Lord. I jump for joy because of his salvation. I don't know about you, but when's the last time you jumped for joy because you're saved? You jumped for joy. I, uh, too reserved, too Canadian, I guess, sometimes. But as uh, jumping for joy is uh, what that word is referring to when it says, I'm rejoicing. It's that excited, that happy about what the Lord has done. She says her horn is exalted in the Lord. In the Bible, the horn is used as a symbol for strength, a symbol of honor. And uh, to say that your horn is exalted, it's saying that You've been raised to a position of power, a position of dignity. And what Hannah is saying here is that I'm brought to great honor. And the author of that honor is the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. She says, my mouth is enlarged over my enemies rather than being put to silence in front of them. Remember chapter one, Hannah was silent as the adversary was continuously threatening her, continuously provoking her. She was so silent that even when she went to pray, she couldn't get the words out. Her mouth moved, but she couldn't make the noise. She was so distraught because of her situation. But now in the Lord, she's able to shout for joy. Her mouth is, in, is enlarged. And over mine enemies. And she's rejoicing. What's she rejoicing in? She's rejoicing because God has done great things for her. She's rejoicing in her salvation. You know, has God done something for you? Has God done anything for you? Then you should be happy about it. You should be happy because of it. If you're saved by the grace of God, then that's something to jump for joy about. Someone has said cheerfulness is something that can be cultivated, and it's the duty of all Christians to show the world by their happy, cheerful lives that Christianity is the most worthwhile thing in the whole world. You know, if God has saved you, if he's done something for you, then shouldn't you be happy? And for Hannah, she's rejoicing in his salvation. Uh, she, look, she looked at her answer to prayer. She she looked at what God had done. She looked at her victory, and she looked all the way past it to his salvation, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she rejoiced. She rejoiced in the Lord. And Christian, the greatest reason we can rejoice is because of his salvation. I rejoice in thy salvation. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. The Lord Jesus Christ was given to us to save us from our sins. That's something to rejoice about. She rejoiced in his salvation. Then secondly, she rejoices in the Lord's sovereignty. Sovereignty. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-T-Y. Sovereignty. I spell it for you because if I was in your position, I'd be wanting someone to spell it for me. And the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-T-Y. But rejoice in his sovereignty. When we talk about God being sovereign, we're saying that God is over all. And that he can do as he pleases with his creation. I just realized I have it spelt like three times on your sheet for you. So <laughs> do you really need someone to spell it for you? <laughs> but <laughs> for those who know the, the Lord, the fact that he's sovereign, that's a wonderful truth. Because when you know the Lord, you know that he always does what's right. He always does what's good. He always does what he said he would do. And Hannah in these verses is rejoicing because God is sovereign. He is over his creation and he can do with it what he pleases. He is the one king. There is no other. Verse number three or verse number two, sorry. We have the fact of his sovereignty, the fact of it. He's sovereign, first of all, because he is holy. He's holy. In verse number two, there is none holy 
as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. When she talks about his holiness, she's referring to the fact that God has no equals. God has no peers. That there is no other God. It's not using holiness in the sense that we use the word in referring to sinlessness, but that's always included as part of holiness. But the word holy simply means that God is set apart. That he's set apart from everything and everyone else. That nothing compares to him. He's the only God. He is so great. He is so infinite. He's so powerful. He is God of gods and Lord of lords. Listen to Isaiah 45, 21 and 22. It says there, there is no God else beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. He is God alone. And Hannah is rejoicing in his sovereignty that he's God. He's holy. Also, he's steadfast. There is none holy as our Lord, for there is none beside thee. And then it says, neither is there any rock like our God. There's no rock like him. A rock speaks of strength. A rock speaks of durability. A rock speaks of something that doesn't change, something that is faithful. And she's reminding us here that our God is the same today as he was yesterday. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same for us today as he was for Abraham, as he was for Joseph in Egypt, as he was for Moses in Egypt. He's still a rock. And when I need him, I can always run to him. He will always be able to help me in my time of need. Uh, she is thankful that her God is not like the gods of this world, who can't answer prayer, who can't help in the time of trouble. She's thankful that he's not in competition, that his ability to help in time of trouble is it's never inadequate because he's being overcome by an enemy. He's sovereign. He's always able. He's always able to help. He is a rock. He's always there as a place of refuge. He's an unchanging God who is strong, faithful, and dependable. And while everything else fails and dwindles, weakens over time, God remains the same. He was our help in ages past. He is our hope for years to come. And in our text, Hannah's rejoicing in that. Isn't that something to rejoice about, that God is sovereign, that he, is, that he never changes, that he's able to help us in the time of need? She's rejoicing in the fact of it. Then in verse number three to five, we see the product of his sovereignty, the product of his sovereignty. What do, because God is sovereign, how does that affect this world? Well, in verse three, we see that it stops the mouth of the proud. In verse 4, it breaks the bow of the mighty and strengthens those who stumble. In verse 5, it empties those that were full and fills the hungry. It gives children to the barren and weakens those who have many. Simply put it, it turns the world upside down. The picture painted in these verses, first of all, is of proud men. Men who go the way that they choose thinking that they have it all, thinking that they are something, thinking that they can live their lives without God and boasting themselves against him. Don't do that, the text says, because God knows what you've said. God knows what you've done. You'll answer to him. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Stop boasting. He, he knows your thoughts. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh at your boast. The Lord shall have them in derision. God is sovereign. He's king. They answer to him. In verse 4, he speaks to the mighty men who are fighting in their strength, fighting against God's people, taking the world by force. The bows of the mighty men, they are broken. God is sovereign. It, 
They're trying to take the world by force, but they forgot there's one person they must contend with, and that's God. You see in history many lessons of this happening. You think of Napoleon and his march against Russia and how he boasted of his plans and said, this is what I'm going to do. And a lady said, don't boast. Man proposes, God disposes. He said, I propose and I'll dispose too. And we all know what happened when he lost and came back home with his tail wagging behind him. And uh, he was wrong. He was humbled. His bow was weakened. He lost the fight. In verse 5, it's speaking to those who are full. Those who have more than enough, they say, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Living with God, living like God, living as kings and queens in the earth, reigning and not caring for those that are hungry, not caring for those who are in need. And verse four, or verse five tells us they will have to hire themselves out for bread, and they that were hungry ceased. Uh, tables will be turned. God will take care of the poor. Then in verse five, we also see Hannah refer to her own situation. She says, and she that hath many, she that, so that the barren hath born seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. She's now talking about what happened to her. Remember, she was the one who was barren. Her adversary, Peninnah, had many sons and daughters. We're not told how many, but she had many. And she was always provoking at Hannah. And that was her life. We saw in her first study how she was oppressed by the adversary, made to weep, made so she couldn't eat, oppressed where she couldn't even talk. And all of this relates to what she was going through with her adversary in her personal life. But in her life, she had seen God do wondrous things. God had turned the tables upside down. He had turned it all around. And she who was barren was able to rejoice in that she bore Samuel. She was strengthened and her adversary waxed feeble. And praise God, you know, for what he does in our lives. He, he always turns it around, doesn't he? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's still the rule. I still feel in my own life, I can, it just seems like every time I get filled with myself, that's when something bad's about to happen. You know, you're doing this project, right? So do you need any help? No, honey, I'm fine. I can do it. So that's when that happens. It's when you say, I'm good. I got it all by myself. That's when I always mess up. I don't know about anybody else, but that's my own personal experience is that it's when I get filled with self. And that's just a silly example, but sometimes it can be serious, can it? We get filled with self and go in our own strength and forget about the Lord. And that's when we fall. But it's when we take the place of a beggar. When we say, Lord, I need your help. Lord, could you help me? Lord, uh, take time in prayer and say, admit our insufficiency. That's when the Lord lifts us up and turns our tables all around like he did for Hannah in our text. We have the product of his sovereignty. This is how God works. Then thirdly, here under the sovereignty of God, we see the scope of it, the scope of his sovereignty. In what areas, what aspects of our lives is God sovereign in? Every aspect of our life, all of it. Starts with death and life in verse number six. The Lord killeth, and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. He's, she's talking here about resurrection, death and resurrection. Who has the power of life? The one who created life in the first place, God. Hannah is an Old Testament saint, but she has no problem believing in the resurrection. And the New Testament we're seeing in We'll look at it more closely one week, but Paul keeps being brought on trial and he keeps saying, you know what's really on trial? The resurrection, the doctrine of the resurrection. That's what's on trial here is that can God raise the dead? And Bible believers have always said, yes, he can. And it was the same in the Old Testament. It was in the New Testament. Hannah is seeing the day of Christ and remembering that he has the keys of hell and of death. He's the one that liveth that is dead and lives and is alive forevermore. 
She sees the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has victory over the grave. He has, he's sovereign, even in death and life. He's sovereign in verse seven, in verse seven and eight with the rich and the poor. In verse seven, we read, the Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. Who is it that made the rich man rich? Who is it that brought him what he has? He says, I'm a self-made man. I, I got it all by my own power. The Bible says there's no such thing. It's the Lord that maketh rich. It's the Lord who maketh poor. First Corinthians 4, 7, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he thought he had built Babylon. He thought this was a result of his greatness. He thought that he was everything in this world and people needed to worship him. And he went out one day and he looked at Babylon that he had created, that he had made, he said. And then the voice came from heaven and said he'd be as the beast of the field until he realized that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. You remember how he went out from his kingdom, lost it for seven years while he ate grass like an ox. His nails grew like talons of an eagle as he was out in the wild for seven years until he finally looked up and realized it's the Lord. It's the Lord that does it all. And Hannah was lowly. In our text, we see that God is God of the lowly. He's sovereign in the materials of this world. And Hannah was lowly, and she saw God answer her prayer. The lowly, the oppressed, the afflicted. I don't need to be despaired, because God is God of the lowly. Listen to verse 8. He says, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he had set the world upon them. You know what this is a picture of to me? Well, I see it as the gospel. Don't you see this as the gospel? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That ye through his poverty might be rich. We're the poor one here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're the poor here. We're the ones that are beggars. We have nothing to claim. We're poor in the dust. We're beggars in the dunghill, not able to do anything to save ourselves, to help ourselves. But the Lord Jesus Christ came and brought us up. He brought us up out of the horrible pit and set our feet upon the rock. He lifted us up from the dunghill and he made us heirs to the kingdom of God. He made us heirs with Christ, joint heirs with him. He changed our lives all around. We're heirs now to the throne of glory. He has set us among princes. And this is just something that God does. This is something that's nothing to him. Physically, in a physical sense, it's nothing to him. Nothing to him to take a shepherd boy and make him a king. Nothing to him to take a slave and a prisoner and make him the prince of Egypt. Nothing to, for him to take the, the, an orphan girl from the tribe of Benjamin and make her the queen of Persia. God can do anything. But spiritually, that's what he did for all of us. When he took humble fishermen, made them the apostles of the lamb, took the poor and the lowly, took us from the dunghill of our sin, from the dust of the earth, and set us among princes and made us heirs of heaven. And nothing can stop the plan he has for us because as the text tells us, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. It's a picture of construction, a picture of the Lord building this universe. It's not to be taken that the, the universe is built like a house, but it's saying when God built it, he, he's the one that had the pillars. He's the one that laid the whole thing. He's the one that did it. It's all his creation. And so 
obviously he can do with it whatever he pleases. He's sovereign. And Hannah's rejoicing in that because she knows that he is the God of the lowly. He visits those who are oppressed. He makes the wrongs right. He's the one who determines to lift up those who are hurting. And gives, and that's for Hannah, gives her hope, gave her reason to rejoice in the Lord. She rejoiced in his salvation. She rejoiced in his sovereignty. And then number three, she rejoiced in his security. She rests secure because she has the Lord says in verse 9, he will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Verse 9 reminds us that the saints are secure. Their feet will not slip. He keeps their feet so they don't stumble as they make their way through this world. They're secure. And it's not in their own strength. It's not because they have some skill or not by their own means. They're secure in him. The wicked, the man living without God, the man who hasn't submitted himself to God, sits in darkness. He tried to make it on his own in verse 9. He tried to prevail by his own strength. But the only way any of us can make it is through the Lord. We can't make it in our own strength. And this text is reminding us of salvation. It's reminding us of how we're saved. It's not by works of righteousness that I have done, but by his mercy, he saved us. And in And if we have the Savior, that's something to rejoice about. There was a Brahmin of distinction who lived in Western India, and he got saved and he got baptized. And by getting baptized in that culture, the, everyone turned his back on him. And he lost his house, lost his field, lost his wealth, lost his wife, lost his children. And that was the law of caste on so being asked how he bore his sorrows, he replied, I am often asked that, but I'm never asked how I bear my joys. For I have joys within with which a stranger intermeddles not. The Lord Jesus sought me and found me, a poor strayed sheep in the jungles, and he brought me to his fold, and he will never leave me. He said, I always asked about my sorrows. I'm never asked about my joys. I have the Lord Jesus Christ. I have something to rejoice about. He rejoices in his salvation. He has something that can't be taken away. We are secure in Christ. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In Romans 7, Paul is rehearsing what it was like trying to save himself. He's trying to keep the law, trying to be saved by his own strength. But he found that in his flesh there dwelt no good thing. He wasn't able to prevail by strength. But he put his faith and trust in Christ. And that's where he found security. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, trying to do it in their own strength. But after the spirit, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ by grace through faith. They are secure in Christ. They've prevailed through him. The adversaries in verse 10, they shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Remember, this is prophetic and Hannah is looking ahead to the day when Jesus Christ reigns. She's looking ahead to the day when this literally happens, when the Lord Jesus Christ executes judgment in the earth and he sits as king and the horn of the anointed the lord jesus christ is exalted there in the earth and i find it amazing that hannah back in first samuel chapter 2 saw the lord jesus christ there in his glory she's talking about him yes you could maybe say david partially fulfilled but no david didn't fulfill this verse 
He was king and the Lord gave him strength. But this isn't talking about David. This is talking about the king of kings and Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day is coming when he'll be lifted up above all and rule the world with the rod of righteousness. And this text is prophetic. It's pointing to that day. And it's important to understand because you look at this text and the fact is we can look around the world and we can see lots of wicked saying things against God, but nothing's happened. We can say lots of, see lots of Christians, lots of the, those living for God who are afflicted, who are oppressed, who are like what Hannah was back in chapter one. But Hannah reminds us the day's coming when he'll turn the tables, when he'll turn it all around. The day's coming when what's said in this text will be true, not just most of the time or some of the time, but the day's coming when it will be true 100% of the time, when Jesus Christ reigns for a thousand years and then forever and ever. And you, like Hannah, you don't have to wait till then to rejoice in the Lord. You can start rejoicing today. Are you rejoicing in him? rejoicing in your king. As a Christian, you should rejoice. Now, my family, we only started the Queen's funeral. We, we haven't watched most of it yet, but uh, apparently we're going to watch more of it at some point. So anyways, but when we were watching the casket being brought through the streets, we noticed the flag that was on the Queen's casket. And I don't know what different things are, but Bethany looked it up. What's that flag that was on her casket? I guess the flag that was on her casket, it wasn't the 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 British flag, I know that, but it was the royal standard. I'm told that the royal standard is the flag that when the queen's in the palace, the flag, the royal standard is raised there so that everyone would know that the queen is there. If the queen wasn't there, then they'd have the Union Jack there. They'd have something different there. But if the queen's there, the royal standard is there. You say, well, Pastor Luke, why are you saying that? Well, there was a man named Principal Rainey, a man that was so happy that a child said he must go to heaven every night. He's so happy every day. But this Principal Rainey, he said this. He said that we have a royal standard as Christians, a royal standard that makes everyone know that the king is in residence in our hearts. And you know what he said it is? It's joy. I think he wrote that children's tune, or maybe he came up with the expression that came, the tune came from. Joy is the flag which is flown from the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. Is the king in residence in your heart? Then like Hannah, you can say in verse number one, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that we looked at this evening. We're so thankful for Hannah's prayer and how we can rejoice in the Lord because of all that he's done for us. I pray, Lord, that we'll learn from Hannah and that we will have that continual rejoicing because of what you've done for us and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.